Okay, Romans chapter 13. Now, you might be thinking, what an odd chapter to be talking about on New Year's Eve Eve and, and, and a message that hopefully is encouragement for 2016 and yet chapter 13 starts off with uh, responsibility towards government <laughs> and, and then in verse 8 responsibilities towards one another you know. and then he gets into kind of the whole purpose of that lead in verse 11 through 14 you know, and we'll get there but we are living in the last days believe it or not <clears throat> I remember when I first got saved and I heard Chuck Smith said, we are in the last days, prepare for the Lord to return. And I was like, wow, this is great. I'm loving it. I can't wait to finally see the Lord face to face. And I was excited about it. But that year went, it came and it went. And the following year and the following year. And 30 years later, we're that much closer to the Lord's return. The Bible is very clear to us when we read Thessalonians, uh, when we read uh, Matthew and the Gospels concerning the last days, that the Lord is returning. He definitely is returning. Uh, when we don't know the day or the hour, uh, when Jesus walked the earth, he didn't even know. Only the Lord himself, the Father, knew. At this time, Jesus does know now when that day will be, but we don't. And the Bible's very clear that we should be expecting it every day. He could come right now. There's nothing holding him back. And so that principle of expectation that he could return, that's a principle that we should keep in the back of our mind, if not in the front, constantly thinking of that every single day. Waking up in the morning saying, Lord, you could return today. You really could. There's nothing holding him back from returning and catching up the church and then the tribulation period's begins the seven years is over and the lord comes back down again to establish his rule and, and reign on the earth nothing at all and we have to live with that expectation it's almost like a pregnancy and, and you'll see that throughout the scriptures a pregnancy and how you're expecting a child in the earlier months you're going okay in nine months we're going to expect this child six months and you're going wow it's really getting close and, and all of a sudden, eight months, and you got one month to go, and then you got weeks to go, and then you're wondering, is it going to be earlier? Is it going to be late? It'll be right on time? And you're really expecting at any moment that you're going to give birth. Uh, my daughter-in-law gave birth Christmas Day at 2.18. Uh, we were expecting it before, or possibly after, but not on that day. And when they were called, they said, no, we're going to the hospital. And so we figured... The baby's coming at that moment. That's ex expecting it to come. And that's how we should expect the Lord to come. And 2016 could be the year that the Lord comes. And I'm not going to get into all the details because we would be here for hours. And I know you don't want to be here for hours. As to the signs of the days. I mean, we can just talk about some of the things that are happening in our world, world today. Uh, the philosophy, the the politically correctness that, that we, we see in our world and society and trying not to offend anybody and being very careful. I, I think of the football team, the Washington Redskins, you know, that name Redskins just offends us and we need to remove it. And, it, you know, we've become so petty and so sensitive. We don't even have a backbone anymore. We just can't say that. That's not the intention there. It is a football team, and they represent Washington, and that's the, 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 the model, the, the M-O-T-O, that they chose. No big deal. But no, 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 there's someone out there that, that might be offended by that. I was just reading something about that. I don't think it's true. But it says, Redskins finally dropped the name. And it says, excellent move. Daniel Snyder, owner of the NFL Redskins, has announced that the team is dropping Washington from the team's name. And it will henceforth be simply known as the Redskins. Listen, it was reported that he finds the word Washington imparts a negative image of poor leadership, mismanagement, corruption, cheating, lying, and graft, and is not a fitting role model for young fans of football. <laughs> uh, 
Right on. I, I saw that. I'm like, no, really? <laughs> really? No, they were, they, whoever wrote that, it, it was great, a, a great response. But it's gotten that bad. I was reading an article just the other day in university, a bunch of, like, we, well, several years ago, they get called yuppies, you know, young kids in college. Uh, they're now trying to push this thing about uh, immigrants coming in here and starting restaurants and how we have offended them because we make them change their their um, culture and the way that they cook meals because they have to Americanize the meals because we really don't like the way they taste in the original recipes. If you go to China and some of those places and you eat some of that food, you're going, whoa. So they kind of have to you know, dress them up a little bit here in America. And so they're really irate at, uh, about all that. We shouldn't have to um, take that. They should be able to cook their food the way they cook it and we should be able to receive it and eat it just like that you know and it's just it's ridiculous what's going on in our world today someone said it's time to get ready to meet jesus does it seem like it's time i think it 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 does I, i think the signs are so clear and one of the signs that i see is is the church itself the apathy the laziness the lack of concern. Oh, uh, they're very clear that they're concerned, but there's really no deed or action behind that. And you see that at the polls. And we have voting for our presidents and, and other issues. The, the, the bathroom bill that, that we just, um, I don't know if it passed yet, but they had to extend it because it didn't pass. They didn't get enough signatures on it. And, and Jack Hibbs, he put it out there. He, he put a post encouraging and thanking those that participated and said that when you stand before God and and he hands out his rewards he's going to thank you for signing that petition which we did all here and you all signed it you know, and you'll receive your reward unlike others who didn't even participate he said and then he shows a Santa Claus in a bathroom with uh, another same sex or opposite sex you know, to get his point across, because that's what it's all about, is allowing two different sexes to enter into the, the restroom in, in our school districts, and public schools, and so forth. So making a statement there, you know. But the church, you look at the church and how we're not busy. He says, the time is ready to meet Christ. The darkness of this world and its ways are not for us. And then he says, wake up. Live in the light of his coming. And that's the expectancy. We need to wake up and see the days that we're living. And we need to really take it seriously. Uh, we're not taking it seriously. Uh, let's, let's digress a little bit back to what was suggested. Join us in reading through the word. We should take that seriously. Getting into the word and getting the word into us will give us principles and will give us commandments of God that have been tried and tested for thousands of years, that have worked in the lives of people that have gone on to live prosperous and religious and very healthy lives compared to the world that has no moral standard or compass whatsoever. And then you have the, is it Martin Sheen, who just came out and said he's got AIDS. And, and now they're expecting a lot of lawsuits from Hollywood personnel that he never said anything about. You know, so you see that immoral, uh, no compass whatsoever, and the church wants to live that way. It really does want to live that way. And so today's message is about waking up, waking up to the Word of God, to the principles and commandments that are here, and really saying, I want to make them mine, and I want to live them out. I don't want to just be lukewarm because there are a lot of Christians that are lukewarm and they're not doing anything. And what does Jesus say? He's going to spit you out of his mouth. Just, you're not affecting the world for Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in verse 11 through 14. It says, and do this knowing the time. And we're going to talk about knowing the time. And that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. 
and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in reviling and drunkenness and lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I mean, I definitely wish you all here in our church, definitely from my heart, as I pray for you constantly, that God would prosper you every day, and especially in 2016. It would be wonderful if you all were prospering and living healthy and walking with the Lord in a, in a powerful way. I, I would just be excited about that, and I would pray for that, definitely. But we may see some hardships like we saw in San Bernardino recently where three people go in and they begin to just shoot innocent people like cowards because they know that they can't fire back. And so times are changing where people are buying guns and ammo and uh, CCWs, concealed carry weapon. And we're going to have, we will see some things change in our society. And I, don't, and I hope that you're not a part of that. I hope that you're not involved, you know, in, in a situation like that or your family. I really do pray that. But I also pray you're ready. I pray you're ready. I know a very close church of mine, and <laughs> it seems like they are excited, and they're practicing with their guns, and they're all getting CCWs, and they're getting ready. And I'm kind of blown away by it a little bit because almost every man that I talk to within that church, they're all talking about having a gun and carrying it, and they're all ready. This is in church. This is a church. It used to be in the old days where churches, even the pastor would carry a gun. Nothing new the times that they lived, and unfortunately we live in those times again. So I hope that you'll be ready too at the same time, uh, ready spiritually, but also ready uh, to do defense if you need to for yourself, for your family, and just for American citizens that may not be able to defend themselves. Today's message is about waking up and getting back to the basics in 2016. It really is because we've, we've strayed from the basics and we've gone back uh, to what was going on in Rome at that time. To maintain a well-balanced life, we must do three things, three simple things. Read God's word. But let me add to that. There used to be a day uh, when a pastor would say, read God's word, and, and, and the implications were understood completely, what he was saying. But today you have to almost define it now because, okay, I'll read his word. But, but it's like a book. Just read it and you throw it to the side. No, read it as though God were reading to you and God were directing you. He was imparting to you his truth, his principles, by which you should live by and apply to your lives. That's how we should read the Word of God. It is not a fictional book. It's not even a historical book from the sense that men wrote it. This is a book that God wrote. He used men to write down the history of Israel and the early church as it went through life, the good and the bad. As I was talking to that Jewish girl that I've been mentioning quite often, she, uh, she said she was reading our website, and she says, why would you put on there that you had a child at the age of 15, 16? Uh, and so that kind of caught me, and I thought, well, because it was the truth? She goes, well, I know it's the truth, but why would you put it on there? You know, and I thought to myself afterwards, well, why would God reveal all the things Israel did? Why did God put Adam and Eve's sin on there? You know, why did he show Bathsheba and David and write all that stuff down there? Because God wants us to realize that every man's a sinner. We all fall short of the glory of God, and without God, we're nothing. We need his help most desperately in this world. Honesty, yeah. Uh, it reminds me of where I came from, the sin that I was involved in and the walk that I had without God that was so selfish. So we need to read the Word of God, but also apply it to our lives. And these are principles that He wants to give us, uh, getting excited. When it says in verse 13, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Wow! Really, God wants us to be subject to them. Yes, He does. 
What does he mean by being subject to them, putting ourselves under? They're our leadership. We should pray for them. And we should support them as long as they don't contradict what God said in his word. Yes, he wants us to support our government. He wants us to pay our taxes. He wants us to do what is right before him. That, that's a principle, and so we have to live by that instead of uh, going to your CPA and going, hey, how can we get out of paying taxes there? <laughs> you know? Come on, give me a way out of this. Well, if we claim this and claim that and do this and that, well, that's not really a part of work, but we, let's just go ahead and throw it in there anyway, you know? I was watching a video. This, is, this was a pastor of one of these faith faith um, ministries. And the judge is asking him because he's been indicted for falsely um, putting expenses <clears throat> on his uh, tax form. And the and the judge says so let me ask you are you serious you spent you spent thirty thousand dollars on suits he's like yeah yeah well what kind of suits are they well you know they're like armani's and you know they're the best suits because i sweat so much and i just can't wash it and you know i gotta get a new one he goes so you buy armani's well they're really not armani's i buy lots of suits but they're like them Wait a minute, you just told me they were Armani's. Well, they are, but, but they're like them. And, and you just he's like lying through his teeth, and you just see it, and you're like, wow, that's why the church is in trouble. Because the world sees that and goes, wow, and he's a Christian. And it's sad when he's trying to make excuses there. So reading the Word of God and applying it to our lives very clearly. And then the second thing is praying. And again, let's define that, praying in faith. Praying to a God that believes and knows that he will answer us according to his will and his purpose and his plans. But knowing that he's alive and that he hears every word that we say by faith. Trusting that he will take care of us completely no matter what we go through. He'll be there and he'll never forsake us or leave us. Because he's the author and finisher of our faith. And so we pray by faith. In him. It's not by fact. It is not by fiction, but it is by faith. Uh, we might not even have the evidence, but yet it's clear through the results that God is alive and well when we pray by faith. So, praying by faith and then fellowshipping with like minded people. I'm talking about like minded people. It's amazing how many Christians fellowship. They call fellowship, but they're fellowshipping with the world. They have a lot of worldly friends, and they like to go out and party and drink and have fun. Those aren't the type of friendships and fellowships that God is talking about. He's very clear in Corinthians that we are not to be unequally yoked, and that's in, in every sphere of life, whether it's business or whether it's our personal relationships. We should not be unequally yoked with individuals that are not like-minded. And I say like-minded because even though they call themselves a Christian, they may not be like-minded like that pastor who was, you know, taking money from the old ladies and old men that are retired and barely making it, and yet he's taking money from the poor. And it was funny because the judge did say that. You mean to tell me you spent you spent $30,000 on suit? You took poor people's money and you went and bought these suits you're, you're telling me that well yeah i have a, a an image on screen that i have to maintain you know i'm like wow wow so just because they say they're christians doesn't mean that they are and like-minded means that they're not gossipers they're not liars they're not cheaters uh, we'll see that in a minute because you hang around those people, you become like those people. We have a tendency of justifying ourselves by hanging around people that believe like us. And that can be in a negative way. I mean, if you're trying to justify your lifestyle, then you're going to find people that live your lifestyle. And so now you feel good about yourself. No, find people that are godly, like-minded, that have a desire to read God's word, apply it to their lives, be godly, be pious, live their faith 
openly. Those three simple things will change your life if you apply them. In this chapter, chapter 13, we have certain responsibilities that we see. We see the responsibility towards authorities, as I just mentioned. We also see responsibility towards our neighbors and our brothers in the Lord. See, during the time of Rome, Paul was on his third mission journey. <clears throat> they believe that he wrote this possibly from Corinth. They're in Rome, the churches throughout Rome, uh, writing to them from Corinth. Colossae was also in that area. These are churches, uh, Rome, that Paul had no um, foundation in. He didn't start the churches. Uh, we believe that they possibly came from Pentecost when Peter preached to the Jews there. They were anointed and they began to migrate towards Rome and they started churches in that area. So Paul literally is going to uh, Rome and writing to them as a, a third party or second party, not have really having a part of their beginning and their foundation, which I find interesting because you seem to have a, 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 a more of a freedom to share honestly and, and biblically than you do when you have a, a, an input because sometimes uh, you know the people and you don't want to offend the people and, and they know you and, and so forth and there's a, a, an amount of restraint that, that just seems to happen. You know, here in the church, there's a certain amount of restraint because you're the church and we have believers and we have non-believers sometimes here and we have strong believers and we have weak believers here so it, it's like a balancing act. How much do you give them? How much do you say? You're going to offend people. That's just, that's just the way it is. Uh, that's the way the church is. And so Paul's writing to the Romans there, and he's writing because at that time, the Rome, the churches there were a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. Now from 41 to about 50-something, four, right around there, Claudius kicked out all the Jews. So that's why we believe that Romans was written after 54, probably about 57, right around there, somewhere in between there. And he's writing to the Jews, and we see that in the first chapters of Romans, but he's also writing to the Gentiles. Well, they were arguing and fighting amongst each other. And they were causing disruptions in the government and society. And it was causing a big problem at that time. There was pride that was going on around there. Uh, there was no evangelism. There was no missionary activity. They had lost all their, their, their compass and sight. They were just living like the culture at that time. And no wonder, eventually, uh, Rome made Christianity a state religion, eventually. Uh, it was easy to do because the people were ready for it, just like we are today. Oh boy, if the state were to come in and say, hey, we, we are for Christianity. We have a state, state Christian church. And, and it's a church that welcomes everybody. It doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter what you believe. You're all welcome because we just love one another. If you want to cook Chinese just the way you want, hey, you're welcome to come in here. You know, even if you don't, then you're welcome too. And if you're homosexual, you're welcome in too. If you're not, you're welcome in too. You know? And, and if your uh, persuasion is the opposite sex, but you like triples in your relationship, hey, you're welcome too because it's headed that way, isn't it? Uh, we see that with the Mormon church, already been doing it for a while, but it's going to be accepted pretty soon here too, where now you can have multiple relationships and be in a marriage with one another because you can love them all just as much as one. So the church really was prideful and had left its commitment to the Lord. And so Paul was trying to encourage them here to get back to the basics, to the fundamentals of evangelizing, to, of being enthusiastic about their faith of Jesus Christ and to send out missionaries. And, and we can see some similarities to what's going on today in, in the church here that we live in because we are, we are secular in a sense. There's a difference between secular and religion. And secular is religion, by the way, because they, they have a set of rules and guidelines. Uh, when you're secular, and, and in fact, uh, I had an article, but I didn't bring it up here. Um, it defines secular as, and, and you'll understand this when I say it, <clears throat> because we're taught it and we've been taught it 
for a long time. But the natural tendency of a human being is really to be good. They desire to be good, and ultimately they want to do the right thing. That's humanism. That's secular. That's their definition of the human being. When the biblical definition of the human being is what? And we saw it in Genesis these last few uh, Wednesday nights, right? Is what? An inclination to sin. Uh, We just have a, a, a desire to sin and do what's wrong. It's in our nature. Uh, and if we're left alone, we will probably choose to sin. And I think all of us understand that completely because we're always tested in that area and we oftentimes choose to sin. So a big difference. And so the church has become secularized. And that's why I was saying earlier that the government can come and say, hey, let's become a state church. You're wonderful. Then everybody can just be loved because isn't God love? Of course he's love. He's the essence of love itself. But love has boundaries. Love protects. And love will not harm, spiritually or physically. But in the secular world, love is more of accepting us no matter what. Sin and all. And it's okay. So we have a challenge this year. And this is the challenge that I bring to you, is that we need to know the time. Look at verse 11. He says, and do this. Now in the Greek, literally it says, you must do this. You must. This is not a, a, this is not a suggestion. It's not a, a request to possibly, as so many do, let me go pray about it. Let me go pray about this. I hear that phrase all the time. Yeah, there are, t- there are times to pray about things. But when you have a responsibility and you're called, then there's no praying. Just go do it. <laughs> you know, just go do it right now. I, I can, can you imagine the board coming to me and say, Ruben, we want you to, to, to teach at the conference. You're the pastor of the church, and so you should be leading and teaching. Well, let me pray about that. Wait a minute. You're the pastor of the church. You should be teaching, not praying about it. That's your responsibility. That's the way you're called here. So don't, don't tell me you have to pray about this. This is the very reason that God has lifted you up in that position. Well, but we want you to go on mission trips. Yeah, okay, let me pray about that one now. Yeah, definitely you want to pray, and you want to seek the Lord for direction and so forth. And we're going to do that in a couple of weeks. Next week I will be gone for a whole week just sitting at the feet of Jesus and and just being encouraged by all these missionaries throughout the world. And then the following week, we begin our prayer and fasting. So these next two weeks are going to be very interesting for for me because I'm going to be in the midst of all that. And I hope for you too. So Paul is is saying to us, we must do these things. there's There's no praying about it. There's no thinking about it. There's no, let's let me see. It says, do this knowing the time or the hour has come is what he's saying here. It's here. So you must do this now because the time's up and you have to do it because there's no more time. If you were asked to do something and you had 30 minutes, you'd probably take your time. Like some ladies and even men that are usually late, well, I got an hour. Okay, so they start doing things. And all of a sudden, that hour, psh, I got 15 minutes. Now I got to get going the other way. And now you're 15 minutes late. No, when you see that you're getting closer, then you get to stop and say, I got to get ready. You know, and it takes me a good 45 minutes to get ready. So I've got to stop 45 minutes before I need to get there to get ready. And so Paul is saying here, you, the time is now. You need to stop what you're doing. You need to get out of this world. You need to stop being secularized. You need to let go of the thoughts and teachings that you were taught when you were a little kid, even what your parents had said. And you need to get into the Word of God, and you need to pull out those principles and apply them to your lives. Genesis is a great book that we're going through, and boy, it should be changing our lives. 
right there. The chapter 3 is powerful. We should read that at least once a month to remind us in our decision making. No, it's time. But first we must realize what time it is. James says, you also be patient, establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. James understood that it was coming too. Well, this was thousands of years ago, Pastor Reuben. Yeah, so we're that much closer today than ever before. And, and, the, and James uses a word here in the perfect active principle, uh, participle, which means that the term kurios was used in the sense of a special period of time. Not just a, a, a regular chronological time. It's the day of the Lord. It's a specific time where He's coming back for his children and believers must live in the fact that at any moment christ would return matthew in 24 7 said one nation shall rise against nation kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places we just had a 4.0 right in devor several aftershocks i felt that one um, nations have been rising up paris got hit by a terrorist Psh, they rose up and bam they struck back real quick we now are supplying some tanks. We're, we're, we're clearing out some ISA in certain areas there. So nation against nation. I mean, we see it all unfolding before us more than ever before. These are all signs of the end times. Paul talks about the, 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 um, the lack of love for one another. There's a coldness. There's a coldness. I was watching a video, and, and they seem to be doing this now, a lot of the youth, because they have the videos and the social media. So this guy decided that he was going to see how people reacted to him winning the lottery. So he decided he was going to be blind. And he's standing on a corner, and he's got a cane, and he goes up to an individual and says, Hey, they told me I won the lottery. Could you, could you double-check this, this ticket? And so he comes to this young guy, and the guy says, Yeah, sure, sure. He grabs it. He looks at it, looks at the guy. He says, So did I win? And the guy just runs, takes off. He didn't say yes, no. He just took off. Because he thought he had a winner. And he thought the guy was blind, didn't see who he was. So then he goes to an older man. And the older man says, yeah, yeah, let me see. Oh, yeah, yeah, you won. You won. He goes, oh, that's wonderful. And then he reaches his hand out to get it. And the guy goes, no, no, I'll keep it for you and I'll go get it. And he puts it in his pocket. And he starts, no, no, I want it now. And he goes, no, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And he starts walking off, the older guy. Do you know who literally helped him and was honest was the homeless people it's kind of funny the homeless people um, amazing amazing how the love of money is the root of all evil and these people would do that to a blind person man you know shame on them shame on us as a society luke seventeen twenty nine. but on the day of uh, on that day again that day the lord's return that lot went out of sodom it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day, that day, when the Son of Man is revealed. Now we know Sodom and Gomorrah. We know the whole story and what was going on there. They were being judged for their wickedness, for sodomy, homosexuality. Very clear uh, that God hates it and God judged it. Uh, so, so much so that even to this day that nothing really grows there because of the uh, whatever he used to really... <laughs> you know, destroy them, uh, worked. It, it just wiped them out completely. And yet we tell God, no, no, you don't know what you're talking about, God. That's, that's not true. You're a loving God and caring God, and so we embrace uh, that lifestyle. We embrace that sin along with uh, those that drink, along with those who take drugs, along with those who, you know, cheat and steal. We embrace them all. We love them all. We know you love them all too. Uh, that's a mistake that's really not what happened we don't believe that happened and so we'll just cut that out of the bible and just, you know get rid of that and that's how they take care of it <clears throat> earlier in, in our not necessarily our nation but in the world we totally understood what god was saying 1519 there was law and government king henry the eighth introduced measures to discourage uh, uh betrothals i guess uh, gambling dens there in London and England. And then further legislation made it sodomy a civil rather than a religious offense. And offenders would be subject to the death penalty. Death penalty. 1519. They understood. 
It was in 1967 when the Sexual Offense Act affecting England and Wales permitted homosexual acts in private between consenting adults over the age 21. So because of the pressure in 1967, they said, okay, uh, in the privacy of your own home and you know, no one else knows about it, then that's okay, you're not breaking the law. And so you see how slowly things change homosexuality was literally you know, you know they, they in, in psychology they have a book with with all the dysfunctions and they they you know list the name and they describe it and so forth and, and in the earlier in the early 1900s homosexuality was in it it was a dysfunction they totally understood that now let me say that as a church this church itself is not being hateful towards homosexuals is just revealing the fact that homosexuality is not the lifestyle that God wants us to live. It's a sin. Just as being an alcohol is a sin and drinking could be a sin for you if you're doing it the wrong way by stumbling others or your children or your wife or any other sin. Stealing and li lying is a big sin. In my book, when you read the scriptures, it's a big sin line. And it's one of those sins that it's hard to determine because you don't know both sides of the story. And you choose sides, and you can't choose sides because no one ever wins when you choose sides. No one ever wins. June 1969, so two years later, the gay rights movement began symbolically in Manhattan. Remember that? Green Rich Village. When homosexuals assaulted police officers raiding the Stonewall Inn in a gay bar. And now their rights began. 1993, the state Supreme Court in Hawaii rules that the refusal to allow same-sex marriage is unconstitutional. And then right here in, in, in our own Sacramento, they began to issue marriage laws. And then Prop 8 came. Peter... 3.3 3 says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust. In the last days, scoffers will come, and they're going to be walking according to their own lust. So secularism. There, there is no morality. There is no desire to follow God's word. They're going to walk in whatever they choose to walk in, and in whatever direction they desire to walk in. Have no one tell them how to walk. So in their own lust, in other words, their own desires, their own ways. So we're living in a day and age where people are really only concerned about themselves and no one else. And if it affects me, mm, don't even bother. I'm not going to go down that road because now you're affecting me and I have rights and I'm an adult and I'm an individual and I'm a person and I have feelings and I have this and I have that. Yeah, and the middle letter of sin is I, 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 I. They even had a country song called I. Remember that song several years ago? And it was all about self. It was interesting because I thought, man, we are so selfish and we don't even see it. And so I decided I was going to look up words that describe selfishness. And so I'm going to, I'm going to say some of these words. There's a lot of them. And when you hear them, you're going to go, wow, you're right. And then you're going to go, wow, <laughs> I'm selfish. Because that's what I did when I read these. So just the word selfishness, right? We all know what selfishness means. And we are, we are selfish at times. And you, can do, you, you can define it in all kinds of different ways, how we're selfish. I didn't get that. I want that. I want this. I want that. How come he got it? How come I don't get it? That's not fair. That's not right. You know, that type of thing. Self-consideration. We've got to have self-consideration here. Self-love, self-admiration. I got to admire myself, don't I? Narcissism, self-worship, self-approbation, self-praise. How about vanity? Vanity, self-pity. There's, there's a self one. Well, wait a minute, but, that's, you know, but I'm hurt. I mean, it's poor me. That's selfishness, self-pity. Self-indulgence. Don't I have a right to indulge myself a little bit? I work hard. I should be able to indulge a little brewski here and there, right? Don't I? Oh. Self-indulgence, ego trip, intemperance, self-absorption, egocentric, tri, 
eccentricity, you know what word I'm trying to say there. Egoism, egotism, individualism. Ain't I an individual? Don't I have rights? Can't I say where we should go or who should we hang around with? Particularism. Well, I'm particular in this area. You're not so particular in that area, but I'm particular in this area. Self-preservation. That one we totally get. Everyone for themselves. <laughs> you know, right? Someone comes in and psh, everyone for themselves. Let's, let's all scatter. I've already set my plan. I'm going straight for the guy. I don't care. I'm going to dump it out. A kung fu movie, you know, you ever see kung, the old kung fu movies? When they hit you, what do they do? They go, and they don't feel the blow, you know, just, and you just keep going. And, and, I mean, and, and if you can scare him enough, he's like, this guy's not going down. They may turn around and run. They may drop their gun, and then you grab it and at least shoot him, and then you're dead, and they're dead. But at least you save lives. Instead of duck and cover and run, I think that's so ridiculous that we do that. You're going to die. At least fight, right? But it's easy said than done. How about axe to grind? I got an axe to grind. Personal consideration. Don't you think I ought to be considered in this situation? You know, it's getting a little personal there. Motives, private ends, personal advantage, selfish, selfish benefit, self-seeking, self-serving, self-interest, concern for number one, numero uno. We say that in Spanish. Looking out for number one, the me decade, no thought for others. Charity begins at home, <laughs> right? Like, wow, we've used these phrases. I was just talking with someone last night, and, and as I'm listening, they're like, well, I'm an individual too. And I'm going, wow, okay, so here's where the problem is. I'm an individual too. I have rights, don't I? Cupboard lullabies, liberal, uh, not generous in giving. That's selfishness, isn't it? Not giving, not being generous in your giving. Uh, meanness as a form of self. Mindedness, pitiness. Miseryless. Greed. How about stingy? Another, another sign of self. Worldliness, worldly wisdom. Heads I win, tails you lose. <laughs> That's selfishness. Mindless, self-ambition, naked ambition, ruthless, ambition, power, politics. And I love the, the recent ones that just we use all the time now. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That's a form of self. I, I'm not pointing to myself. I'm just saying. Yeah, you're pointing to yourself or just keeping it real. We're just keeping it we're just keeping it real, right? We're just keeping it real. These are all forms of selfishness. Now you get my point where we are as a society and where we're headed. They think more of self than they think of God. First Corinthians seven twenty nine, but this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on even those who have wives should be as though they had none. That's a hard saying to understand. What is Paul talking about? There's a time and place, the end, where we need to forget about our relationships. The Lord is coming back and we need to get busy. He says, now that time is high in Romans there. It is high time to awake out of sleep, he said. My sons used to sleep a lot when they were kids. Probably because they were growing. But on Saturday morning... It was time to get up. <laughs> we got work to do. And so I'd wake them up. Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for, tr for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. And we see that's exactly what has happened in our society. Then he goes on and says, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Uh, it, it's ready. And the word salvation there is not talking about us being saved. That word salvation is sortria, referring to the day of the Lord. That's when the salvation is done by the Lord when he comes back for us. 
So that's salvation he's speaking of. That day when the Lord comes back is nearer than ever before. We need to believe that. Now we come to verse 12 through 14. I just want to read this to you and just let it soak in because this is our society today. And it tells us here what we should be doing as a church. It says, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. So knowing this, 2016 is coming. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Come on, guys. Let's just cast them off. Let's get rid of that garbage and stuff. Just throw it away. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us prepare ourselves to battle what the Lord has in mind for us. Let us walk properly. Let's not cheat. Let's not steal. Let's not lie. Let's not gossip. Let's not cause division. Let's not do those things that the enemy wants to do. Someone said, as they were being accused, it's the first time I've ever experienced that situation. I actually have two accusers now. Satan and you. See, there's only one accuser of the brethren, and that's Satan. But so many times we start accusing, and we align ourselves with Satan. Walk properly as in the day, not in revilery and drunkenness and lewdness and lust and strife and envy. Get rid of those things. How do you get rid of them? By putting on, verse 14, putting on the Lord Jesus and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lust. The only way that you can get rid of that stuff is by putting on Christ more. In other words, getting busy with Him, serving Him, putting Him on. You know, you ever, you ever find yourself when you're working and you're working hard and, and you may even be enjoying it, how the day goes by really fast? You ever do that? Isn't that interesting? But then there's those days where you're like, I don't really want to work. And it's like the day is just dragging. What he's saying is, work for the Lord so it takes up the day. You don't even have time for the works of the flesh. You don't have time. Your time is divided by the Lord, not by you. And so you're not watching TV. You're not playing games. You're not goofing around. You're serving the Lord. You're here at church working on a trailer because you're off. And so you're not just staying home and giving provisions for the flesh. That's what he's saying here. So put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh. So let me close with, with this. And here, here's my application and plea to you as a church for 2016. And here's my concern. I wished that all the 28 people that serve here were here tonight. I wish they were all here so they could hear this. <clears throat> we have to understand church. And I've seen it throughout my years and have confirmed it with recent meetings with other pastors of churches of various sizes from thousands thousands I'm talking four or five thousands to hundreds fifties talking to a guy just the other day had 50 50 people in his church and he's been faithful to serve there because it's not about numbers but yet every pastor struggles because of thousands the pastor of thousands loses a thousand and he's thinking maybe God's done with me but he's still got five 6,000 people, and yet God's done with him? But see, it's human nature, and that's the heart of a pastor. But in ministry, you'll notice something if you're in it long enough, if you can endure and persevere, is that there are peaks and then there are valleys. And so there will always be the peaks, the high times, and you'll enjoy it, but also prepare for the valleys because people are constantly coming in and leaving and going out. Just even recently, I was uh, talking with someone and said, hey, where, where, where has uh, that person been? And they said, oh, yeah, you, you offended them when you mentioned homosexuality. And they're just like, no, they're not going back there. So truth hurts, and it's going to hurt people. And people aren't going to make the right decision to say, I want what God wants. And if God says this, then I have to believe it, and I have to receive it. I'm just the messenger, and I have to be faithful with the message, no matter how difficult that may be. 
because the truth is the truth, and I can't sway from that. I, it's not in my nature, first of all. I'm just saying. <laughs> Being selfish there, I don't want any attacks. So those are my concerns in the body of Christ. The divisions, the gossiping, because it happens. It happens, it happens in this church, and it shouldn't be happening at all. We should be working together. And so I'm asking the church, our church, and I'm talking to specifically our church, to commit ourselves for one more year. For 2016, commit yourself to say, Lord, I am committed to this church. For one more year, Lord, I am going to go to this church on a regular basis, go there on Sundays, if I'm working, then go there on Wednesdays and I'm going to commit myself to that ministry and I'm going to support the leadership. I'm going to pray for the leadership. I'm going to stand by the leadership. No matter what, I'm committing myself, Lord, to you to support the people that you have raised up in this community, Lord. No matter what happens around me and it will happen even in 2016 because there will be those who are not committed to the church to this ministry, or willing to pray, but they definitely will pray on the church and the people in the place and spread lies and rumors, but not commit themselves. And also to commit to reading his word and following it. Make a commitment. You want to call it a New Year resolution, that's fine, but commit yourself to say, I'm going to get through the word of God. This two-year plan sounds like it'll work. If it's not going to work for you, we have some pamphlets back there, and they'll get you through the Bible in one year. It's one that I have written up, and it's got a little little uh, notepad on the back of it, and I always encourage people, when you have a question, write it down there. Just write your questions on the back. And as you're going through, you'll be amazed how God answers those questions. It is amazing when you actually put it on paper and you watch. But get through the Word. Commit yourself to get into the Word, but to receive it as though God was speaking to you and asking you to change your perspective and your views. You've got to change. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And so there has to be growth in your life every single day. You should be able to look back last month and say, I have some growth there. Or I don't have any growth. Why is that? What am I lacking? What am I not doing? What is God asking me to do? What is God asking me to let go of? For instance, you know, um, this whole speech thing, and I know there's young, young believers here, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time, by the way. It always takes time. Um, you just can't clean up that quick. It, it takes time uh, for the Holy Spirit to change you, change your vocabulary, change your thinking, and, and so forth. But it takes effort on us to keep applying it even though we, we struggle with it. For instance, you know, uh, this whole secular idea that, that man is naturally good. You know, that's, that's a false theology. It's false. God has been very clear that there are none good. There are none righteous. No, not one. Not one. So if there are none righteous, then that should be our philosophy. God, there are none righteous. Now, it doesn't minimize the value of an individual, it doesn't at all. You can still understand that, that we're not righteous people, that we have the ability to sin very willfully. But God values us because he sent his son to die on the cross for us. So we are valued. And we're not to look at each other, oh, you wretched, no good, nothing, sinner. Yeah, he is, but you're to love him. You're to help him. You're to encourage him. Not chop him down, make him into a stump. You know, and so taking that principle there and say, no, the Bible says that we are sinners. And then as a parent, you go, well, my son's a good boy. No, he's not. <laughs> the Bible says he's a sinner. He's not a good boy. He has a tendency to sin. I can tell Ethan, and it's Ethan because he's at that age now, and you know, we have him all the time. It's like, Ethan, leave your sister alone. Two seconds later, Ethan, didn't we just say to leave her alone? Yeah, I know. You know. It's like we have the tendency of doing the things that we're told not to do, to do. 
And the things that we're supposed to do, we don't do them, like Paul says in Romans chapter 7. Very clear. Here's a grown man, and he's admitting it. I'm a sinner. God tells me what to do, and I don't do them. And then he tells me what to do, and I'm not doing that either, you know? And so we struggle with it. So then understanding that, hey, you know, my kids are prone to sin, and so I totally get that. But let's, uh, let's train them. Let's teach them. Uh, let's, let, let's show them how to live. Let, let's show them to be adults, to not lie, cheat, and steal. Understanding, though, they're going to have the tendency of doing that, forgiving them, and, and working at it until one day they have the victory over it. You know? And so when you get that in you, then you totally understand what God is doing. And, and we're not buying into the lies that are out there. And unfortunately, the world has bought that. So every president that's a nominee that's going up there to run is like, oh, he's, he, he's a good guy. They're all good. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. So commit yourself to reading and studying the Word of God and changing, surrendering your life to the Lord. I see 2016... I'm not trying to be prophetic here at all, but I can see the Lord coming back. I can see our nation suffering some more incidences. Um, just the other day, and no one really heard about it, but there was a, a shooting in Rancho Cucamonga. Someone dead. The police had to kill that guy there. So we're going to see more of this stuff. We're, we're going to see people standing up, uh, arising, and making sure that uh, our Constitution is, is hopefully still intact if it's not already not. But we're going to be challenged, definitely. Work hard. Serve the Lord. Be faithful to Him. He promises to take care of us, to protect us and be with us. Uh, some may die. Some, some were Christian in that, that shooting there. And they're home with the Lord and we rejoice and we have that hope that absent from this body is present with the Lord. There's nothing to fear, to dread, except that we're going to miss them because they were here with us, but one day we'll be with them when we get to heaven. And so we have a hope that the world doesn't have. And we need to keep that in mind and let the world know that, that they need that same hope, the hope of Jesus. So, so Paul's saying, Rome, look. You Jewish, Gentiles, let's get together, let's work, let's stay, get focused, let's evangelize, let's get the message out there, let's see people come to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what 2016 is about, is that the church gets together and gets busy with the gospel and making disciples of men, but true disciples. Not this, come receive Jesus, confess him as Lord and Savior, and then go on with your life and live it. No, you need to change, and we should challenge one another to change. We should challenge one another to change. We shouldn't be offended by that. You know, Quint mentioned something at first service that he got out of my message on Christmas. You know, first, don't be like Ahaz. <laughs> we don't want to be like him. And then second is that, uh, yeah, there's some signs, and God gives us signs. And I, I didn't really correct him. I just said, hey, I want to correct you. But my, my point was, no, the sign is Jesus Christ, right? That's the sign. He goes, no, you're, you're, you're right. And that was my point. Jesus is the sign. Ahaz had to look to the sign. We look back to the sign, Jesus Christ. We don't need, we don't need no stinking signs. <laughs> we got Jesus. He died on the cross. He resurrected from the dead. That's enough. That should be enough for us right there. That should give us the strength and the power to live for him. Our God has resurrected from the dead. Muhammad hasn't. Buddha hasn't. There is no other religious system out there that suggests that their leader has resurrected from the dead. It's only Christianity. Jesus is alive. He's alive because he has power over death itself. And so we should not fear. We should rejoice. Now some of you might not understand that because I know you're you're young in the Lord. You're really going, whoa, this is powerful. What is this guy saying? Read your word. Get into it. Don't give up. Don't run away. Read it. Study it. And you'll, you'll, you'll get it when you surrender to the Lord and allow him to minister to you. You'll get it. And, and it'll be a, you'll be amazed at how your life changes because of it.